Therese, great to see you again. Long time no see, Gary. Yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to connect here. Um, I thought it'd be great maybe if if we could just start and just get the quick high level story on on what brings you to this work. Hmm. Yeah, and I'd love for you to answer that question as well. Um, you know, I I grew up with like a bug in my ear always about um, service, right? giving back and um, social change, social justice. Uh, for me, it was always like I had this lens, this sort of distorted lens of you got to go make a bunch of money so you can give it away to do good. And I was playing that game for a very long time uh, until the carousel stopped. And the first thing that um, I had done and started in a, in a while, I did not work out. And it was a big wake up call, kind of a knock over the head from the universe. And after taking some time to reflect, I just said, you know what, I only want to work on things I love with people I love. And that was really the foundation for starting um, Uprising and the work that I'm doing now and supporting entrepreneurs that we feel that way about and you know, whose missions deeply inspire us. How about you? Yeah, fantastic. Similar, although you know, the truth is all can be encapsulated in like a 30 second answer. Yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> well, I was going to say similar, but, you know, I, I, I'm probably not as smart as you because it took multiple knocks. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, I had uh, long story short in, in investment banking, I had my personal consciousness path and I had my investment banking career and never did the two meet. Uh, and at some point I just woke up and said, hey, it's it's time to figure out how to do this business uh, in areas that I carry a lot of passion and, and carry a lot about and especially bringing my consciousness uh, learning and growth path into banking. So uh, part of that was uh, leaving a larger firm and founding influence uh, and keeping you know mission aligned business and working with companies with a purpose beyond profit uh, at the center of what we do. Well, I don't know that I'm any smarter than you. I think you, know, you were just more aware to actually notice the knocks that I missed. And you're far more brave to be doing it in banking. You know, it's a lot harder to do it in banking than than VC, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Well, you mentioned uprising, um, and when we've chatted before, you have a whole investing approach around things that are really impactful. Uh, maybe you could just start by talking about your approach a little bit. Yeah, be happy to. Um, it's really quite simple, you know, beyond just looking for amazing teams and characteristics about, you know, builders and creators that I think a lot of other people think about. The, the two things that we can attack on to that uh, that are fundamental for us are, uh, are what we affectionately call our goosebumps filter, which is our embodied sense of like, is this mission that these this team is working on something that can lead to more systemic change, more fundamental change and, and transformation, not just kind of incremental movement on, on challenges. And then the other piece is something we started off calling a values filter. Um, you know, it was really about why people are doing what they're doing. Do they see their companies as an act of service? Do they see it as a contribution to the whole, as a problem worthy of their life? Um, and increasingly, we've shifted to thinking about that not just as um, that values alignment, but actually looking at sort of underneath that, that the, the question of like, are the people we're backing interested in the kind of process of who they're becoming as they build? Uh, and this sort of question of how interchange and our inner development informs what we're creating and building in the world. So I'll leave it there, but at a high level, those are two things that we care deeply about and that we look for in all the companies that uh, we invest in and teams that we back. Yeah, thank you. That's that's super helpful. And there's actually a couple of jumping off points there that, that I wanted to explore is just one of the things that you mentioned is, it, you know, the founders and executives and how they're working on themselves were big proponents of conscious capitalism, conscious leadership and conscious cultural development. 
Uh, and I know you are too, but maybe you could describe how you bring that work uh, into your investing and in the companies you work with. Hmm. Yeah, and uh, and I'm curious to hear how you're bringing it into into companies you work with too. Sure. Um, you know, there's I think there's a couple layers to it. I mean, one of it is just um, I think it starts with each of our own commitment to uh, to those practices for ourselves and for us. It's been in our partnership. So our partnership uh, has started off as sort of the container to experiment with a lot of stuff and um, kind of bring it in and digest it and um, uh, you know ground it. And then from there, we take the things that are resonant with us. Uh, and think about um, you know where are the where are the places where are the teams that we have even actually some of our investors you know who might resonate with this particular practice or this particular person or community and um, uh, just trying to kind of create that ground right that invitation uh, for them to uh, to join and, and participate um, and so there's a whole bunch of things in there but you you mentioned conscious leadership I think one of the big anchor foundational pieces for it for us um, has been the conscious leadership group, Jim Detmer and Diana Chapman they wrote this book called The 15 Commitments of Conscious Leadership. So each of uh, myself and my two partners are in forums with nine other people that meet every month for half a day and you know, do weekly check-ins and we get to practice and use tools. Um, and now we've enlisted a number of our entrepreneurs and, and some of our investors and friends and our community to join um, that as well. And I think the communities of practice to reinforce uh, and have sort of common language and tools has been been really, uh, really impactful for us. And I think it's, you know, uh, Gary, like, you know, we were talking about this earlier, right? This, this idea of um, giving yourself permission to be more of yourself <laughs> um, and how sometimes hard that can be. Uh, but I feel like the more we do that, the more naturally it just happens around us. Um, cause that it's like, we are more sort of the walking invitation to, to the practices. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost parallel paths. Uh, I mean, not surprisingly perhaps, but, um, <laughs> we, uh, well done, Nicole. Well done. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, no wonder she put us together in quite the design. Um, but yeah, we, we, you know, I always say we start, it starts at home. So we, we embed these practices in our own partnership, uh, have it rolling across the organization, work with coaches um, really across the board on, on the conscious development and conscious leadership. Uh, and then we're, we're actually, you know, as when we launched Influence, it was uh, almost three years ago now. So in some ways we had our hands full, making sure the flywheel was turning uh, in our core business and, and we've achieved that. Uh, and so we're just now starting to work with, <coughs> excuse me, how, how we wanna roll that out into the community. So we're looking at one partnership where there's sort of a year long conscious leadership um, class that's written by Raj Sisodia uh, he was one of the founders of Conscious Capitalism, Inc., which is an organization I'm pretty active in. Um, we're talking to a group some of I'm sure the audience is familiar with second time founders. Uh, they have a really interesting and innovative program that's also partially built on Conscious Leadership Group. Yeah. Uh, so looking for things like that where we can, you know, really guide uh, CEOs who are in our community to uh, learn and implement these practices uh, in their business and, you know, be an active permission for them. Um, and as you say, it, 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 it's a flywheel of its own. The more, um, the more you focus on it yourself, the more it resonates with people, the, the, the more the flywheel turns. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, wh one of the things that, um, you know, again, I, I find fascinating, and this is some of the territory we cover uh, in the Mission Align Growth Summit, uh, which is uh, used to be an annual back when people could get together. Uh, now is a monthly salon series. Um, but is this idea of aligned capital? And, and so when, you know, I think you and I both agree that there's not enough aligned capital at the growth stages of a business and most 
most um, companies at scale have to bring on quite a bit of traditional capital. Uh, and so how do you look at and are called into being a little more active in the cap tables you're in and, and maybe boards you're on uh, to bring this perspective into those companies? You know, what have you seen gone well and, and what have you seen gone wrong? Yeah. Um, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, <laughs> let me see if I can still, I, I think, you know, before we get to what we do, right, the question of like what's going on there and 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 what goes wrong and what goes well, I think, you know, if we put, there, there's plenty of horror stories, right, from misaligned investors um, with short-term thinking or, you know, other things that are sort of out of alignment with what the company's mission really is. But, you know, if we put aside, I think, the bad behavior and and things like that, right, even in situations where you have a great group of investors, who are founder supportive and founder friendly. I think that um, what I notice, and we, you know, we were talking about this in a different context, Gary. Right? Is that um, like this idea of like becoming more of ourselves? Right? If if founders are looking to bring more of their heart uh, and their humanity into what they're what they do, right? Um, there's a lot of limiting beliefs about our ability to do that in business that we all hold unconscious, consciously, and you know, it really takes like being held, you know, by your investors, right, by your board in a way that encourages that, right, and helps that to unfurl and unfold and express itself um, in all the aspects of how we hire, how we build culture, our vision for what we build, our willingness to question our answer, you know, on, on so many levels, like that is a I mean, you know, it's a it's a powerful thing, and I think so few people have had it that we don't even realize it in the sphere of the businesses we <laughs> we're building. We we see it maybe in our personal lives and other areas, um, and I think that there's a tendency for boards to kind of you know lowest common denominator denominator you know down into like you know making decisions from the place of the you know one or two people that are the most scared uh, or the most reticent, and so I think that. The bigger opportunity here, right, which not a lot of us have really seen, is what would it look like if there is that alignment and coherence, you know, on a bigger level? I think what we do see is, you know, founders who have a lot of influence, um, control things are going well, right, and and we see them supported, oftentimes like maybe not as like as strongly, you know, by investors, but other people in their community, right, who are leaning in and trying these practices and. You know, um, you know, willing, willing to 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 sort of move the needle forward. So, for us, you know, we've been much more in that latter category for a long time. You know, I think early stage investors, uh, which, which we've typically been, you know, are supportive. And, and when it comes time to put in larger amounts of capital, uh, and you get the more traditional dynamics that occur at that stage, like we we hadn't been playing there very much. And we've just started to, you know, we made our first couple investments at a level of scale, um, you know, where, where we're starting to get to play with that. So it's early, um, but if we're the only ones, right? Um, and there's alignment with the founder, you know, there's, uh, there's a certain amount that can be done, right? Um, but I think it's 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 a, it's a process which takes time, and that you know everyone has to feel comfortable uh, engaging in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I think in, as we've as we've talked about, that's such an unmet need in the market that uh, you know we're we're hoping to help crack uh, as as we get to a little bigger scale ourselves. So right right there, right there with you. Well, um, on to the mom and love portion. I remember uh, wondering, like, what the hell is this mom thing? Like, yeah. uh, I'm uh, so interested in this Tabriz guy, but like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, <laughs> maybe you could tell us a little bit about Devoted, and you know, uh, you know, maybe start with the company, and and the thing that I I really appreciate is just the level of intentionality in the business around the idea of love, you, you would describe it better than I, but that's, that's one of the fascinating, fascinating elements for me. Yeah, this is um, the genesis of our panel, at least, you know, for me was, you know, I'd shared, um, you know, with Nicole a bit of the story. And I think, you know, she pinged me one day and she's like, Teresa, I can't get this idea in my head. Like it just keeps coming up, the idea of like bringing love into business. Um, 
And uh, so that story is a story that you mentioned of a company called Devoted, um, started by two brothers, uh, Todd and Ed Park, uh, were incredible humans and successful entrepreneurs. Todd was also um, CTO in the United States government for President Obama. And, you know, they, they started a company um, initially focused on seniors, eventually could go everyone to go to everyone, but it's, its mission is to take care of seniors as if they were literally family, if, if they were literally mom. And so they have a prime directive in this kind of core value of love, which is a question that everyone needs to ask themselves whenever they're faced with a tough decision is, when I'm faced with this decision, what would I do for the person I love most, for mom? And then don't ask anyone any questions, just go and do that thing. And, you know, they are, think of them as like a next generation Kaiser Permanente. So value-based insurance company and physician supergroup on steroids designed from the ground up to scale nationally. Um, and, and in that, they are able to, they've got a business model which aligns and a long-term orientation, which aligns around behaving in that way. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of talking about it in the abstract is, is tough. So maybe I'll, I'll give a, a couple of examples. So when COVID hit, um, Devoted basically said, well, what will we do, right, for, for, for our parents and our families? Well, we would reach out to all of them right away on a very personal basis to let them know what's happening and to prepare them. And for seniors who are the most vulnerable, they're gonna be stuck at home. Like we would be bringing them food. We would be getting medicine to their homes. We would, you know, we would be, you know, thinking about their mental health in isolation. So I think the company made a bunch of decisions, which like, you know, in the kind of traditional world would just seem crazy and ridiculous, right? Where they repurpose teams and basically like, like personally reached out to like tens of thousands of people um, in order to protect them, in order to save them, in order to save lives and, uh, and treat them like they would treat their own family. And, you know, the result of that, you know, bears out, even though that's, they didn't do it to save money, to keep people out of the hospital and, you know, to, to have higher NPS scores, right? Um, all of that, all that stuff happens as a derivative, as a follow on of, kind of orienting ourselves from that place. Um, and one of the favorite stats, you know, that, that, that I think, you know, comes out of that is, you know, as a, as a, what is, looks like an insurance company to a member, to a consumer, to a senior, they have an 83 NPS, right? Which is like <clears throat> unheard of in the insurance world, right? Like the average NPS in the insurance industry is 12. Um, and you cannot do that with technology and process, um, and even clear values and other things like that comes from a place um, of deep love and trust that engenders with members. And as you, so when did you first get involved with Devoted and what, um, you know, sort of what, as you go back to how you invest, sort of draw the connection points. Um, so story of how we got involved uh, was I, um, I reconnected with Todd at a dinner uh, that a friend had organized around um, uh, some philanthropic initiatives that he was involved with, and um, you know we said let's let's catch up. You know after this dinner, it took a couple months, and and it really you know I knew he was up to something interesting. You know um, they weren't raising money at the time, but it was actually you know one of those things. I think like the best investments come when we're not like actually looking at a deal right and it was just it was, just a, it was a connection it was like an immediate you know brotherhood right like some kind of a connection that sort of transcends time and there was like a knowing of like wanting to do stuff together so when time came for their next fundraising round um you know they they had a long list of suitors um but i think um they were really orienting right in a different way and um and so we got a chance to play a meaningful role and in their Series B financing that occurred in um, fall of 2018. And I'm curious because they have, you know, traditional investors, Venrock, who's obviously a longtime healthcare investor. Yeah. Uh, Andreessen, you know, very yeah. Silicon Valley. Um, yeah. 
uh, firm. So how do you see some of the dynamics playing out? Because Series B is pretty early and, and they've done really well since. <laughs> uh, so, so how do you, some of the things we were talking about on alignment of capital versus sort of traditional ecosystem capital have, have played out on, on this one? Yeah. I mean, I think this is a very unique example in that way. Uh, very unique example. Um, I can't really think of anything that's quite like it, actually. So it may, it may not actually be the best example. We just had a board meeting actually yesterday, so we were all together, this group of people, and they're all uh, they're all amazing, absolutely amazing humans. But I think what they're oriented around is the magnetic field of Todd and Ed and that team is so incredibly strong. So every investor and every person around that table is someone that's worked with them for years and years and years, in some cases, 20, 25 years. Like Brian Roberts at Venrock back Todd when he was a senior associate at Venrock, right? And his first company called Athena Health. So it's like, there's so much history and understanding and trust, right? Um, and so I think everyone is deeply aligned, right? Like those founders were able to, they were in a position to align others that were um, down to like operate a company right in this particular way that was going to be radically different than um, the way a lot of other companies are run. So, so they, I think, are a point in their careers <laughs> where they were able to get that alignment right, um, uh, right. in a way that's like extremely unique. Yeah. 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 And but it's still, but you know, it's still our job to sort of, you know, I feel like uh, our job, but like, you know, we relish the role of still like instigating, right, and pushing the envelope. Like, how do we go further, right? Like, how can yeah. we do more? So, you know, I think for us, there's, it's been much more at the company level and supporting the founders and the executive team mm -hmm. in those questions um, and in those practices, um, as opposed to kind of at the at the board level. But hopefully, when we get when we, you know. We get back to doing in-person board meetings and not virtual. We can we can have some fun there too. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna hold you to the it not being a perfect example. And how about another example <laughs> <clears throat> where maybe it's a younger entrepreneur or you know without naming names. Well, I'm also uh, seeing Nicole's putting a question in here about ah, how okay. personality shows up inside of tech. Mm. Um, um, I, you know, I feel like asking you, Nicole, like, oh, and how do we carve our ethics into the tech itself? Mm. I think that there's, there's an aspect of this question, right? Which is, um, um, it's, 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 it's like, what are the best practices? What are the ways, like who's really doing that well? And, and they have like very distinct processes for doing it. And like, there's, that's one conversation. <laughs> Right. There's another conversation here, which I think is like the real essence of the question, which is who we are, right? What we believe in and consciously or unconsciously makes its way into everything that we build. And, um, and so if we think about like just the process of like the, the external doing Right. There's a certain amount of optimization we can do there. There's a certain amount of improvement we can do there. But if 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 we're doing the work in here, right, to um, to question our answers, to upgrade the meaning making engine, you know, um, then 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 those beliefs, right, that expression uh, of like our, our 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 higher biggest selves, you know, our best selves. Uh, and our hearts will come through naturally. Like we will ask different questions. We will design differently. We will think, we'll have a sense of connectedness, you know, to other and proximity to um, to other experience that can allow us to, um, you know, to develop more compassionate tech and not just sort of, you know, project our sense of the world into what we're doing. So I think it it is mostly about starting there and it's about, companies and cultures cultivating those practices. So the individuals doing it, but being supported in community by the company, the advisors of the company, the board of the company, it's like everyone in a practice of doing it. And I think it just, it can't not make its way into the tech over time, you know? Uh, so that's, that's the starting point for us. Sorry, Nicole, if you wanted something that was like, you know, much more directed, um, you know, <laughs> specific. But I think that's 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 really where all the gold is, um, as much as, um, you know, it may not be the popular answer.
Yeah, I, I, I think that's spot on. I mean, for me, intentionality is the very heart of the mission aligned question. Um, and this is where um, we see, you know, we, I, I get asked the question a lot, what does mission align mean? Mm. And, you know, I half jokingly say, you know, it when you see it. Yeah. Um, but it's, you know, when the decision making is, gu is guided by that mission. And to your point, often what you'll see is that that founder, CEO, executive team, the more they know themselves, the more embodied, if you will, the mission is in the organization. Yeah. And when that mission sounds good, or even if they have a great level of intention, this is where I think the capital has a play. When, when the capital starts getting noisy, if you're not really grounded in that mission, that intentionality, yes, that's when you see companies starting to stray a little bit. Um, and for me, the super fascinating, and there's Nicole. <laughs> well, I actually came back to talk with you, not to shoot you up. <laughs> nice. Because <laughs> it's just, um, you know, actually, Tabriz, when you talked about the intentionality, that's actually what I wanted you to talk about. Because I think, you know, one of the things that, that I think people don't get is that, uh, that many people often don't get is that um, who we are shows up in what we build. Um, and, and I think it shows up all the way down to, um, you know, how the technology actually works. Yeah. And so when we have best practices around the end point, like are the buttons this color or that color, then we can miss, you know, yeah. so many other things that are going wrong. And then we say, oh, but, but I, I made the buttons pink. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? And it's like, well, no, no, that's not the part where you ask yourself. <laughs> Were you asking yourself the question? Because it's like one of the things about this stuff is that, you know, when things go like often in this space and you can have seen it in the chat where people are talking about it. Um, if you've watched the show all day, you are simultaneously inspired and worried because yeah. the tech is powerful. Yeah. Like, you know, the ability yeah. to, you know, capture, measure, influence, uh, with this technology that's coming out of the space is super powerful. And we haven't even gotten to the point, I would say it's probably like in one to two years, we're going to have a hyper compounding and you're going to see an explosion yes. of, of what's possible. And so, you know, one of the things about it, like tomorrow we're going to have Dr. Raphael Yust speak. Um, and he was one of the architects of, um, you know, creating the, uh, the basically the equivalent of uh, the human genome project, but for the brain. Uh, and he also has a thing uh, called the uh, neural rights uh, because people, you know, this, this is such a fast moving yes. space That's that right. if you focus on the sub bullet points instead of the intentionality, you know, you can build a museum on, you know, this corner of the street and, you know, when, where the action actually is going to happen is 300 feet, you know, to the other side of it. And if you focused on, you know, just these rules and regulations, and, and I think there is a role for regulation in this space, um, then, you know, you could miss actually the place where founders and investors and, you know, consumers, like where we really need to be thoughtful about what these things do and how we how we have them intersect in our lives. So you actually answered the question I wanted. <laughs> well, uh, I'm very happy about that, and yeah, I couldn't I couldn't agree more with what you say. And I think Nicole, it's you know I know we're running out of time, but it's when the things we build, right? Because we're inevitably not going to get it perfect, right? And so when they cast shadows, right? Um, it's the willingness to really look at it to understand it and then the courage to say, you know what, like, even though I built this amazing thing, like it, it, it needs to change, right? And, and having that come, you know, from within uh, is something that's gonna be important when we're, you know, when we're playing with the power of the gods, right? As you, as you yeah. spoke to. Well, you know, we spend, so for our academy uh, and our education programs, a quarter of our content is on founder growth and development. Uh, because, you know, when you're, at the head of innovation for a fast moving space. Like a lot of times when I give my talks, um, I'll tell people, you know, whatever horrible thing you think is going to happen, what's going to happen is much, much worse. Like there's gonna be an instant 
that's that's worse than anything that you can possibly imagine. And so, you know, what we need is we have to have uh, the we have to have the courage, uh, we have to have the character, uh, we have to have the groundedness within ourselves that when we see the whiff, the first beginnings of an unintended consequence, we can actually do something about it. Uh, because we can't stand at the at the at the head of innovation and know what will happen. And in addition, if we don't move, if we don't build good things that support the minds of mankind, then the only people who are moving are you know the the bad actors that everyone is worried about. And then the future that people are concerned about, it actually comes to pass. Right. Like the only way that it doesn't is if we build the good things. Uh, but to do so, we have to be in the right place so that we can you know, so that we can have intentionality baked into everything all the time uh, and therefore, you know, be worthy of building these types of tools. Amen. Amen.